Welcome to Poly 303, the Strategic Studies of China. Lecture 1, Review of Methodology. You can see on the left, Empress Qixi, who was the last empress of the Qing dynasty. And on the right, you can see Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who was one of the important personalities in the overthrow of the Qing dynasty, and his wife, who's one of the famous three Sung sisters. In this class, we're going to use the positivist methodology. We're using the scientific approach not for ideological reasons, but because it's essentially very useful. It allows us to identify the variables in a phenomenon and then to make predictions. This is the most important lecture, not only because it's going to guide how we look at the material in the course, but also it's going to be the structure for your final paper. Your paper is ultimately going to be a social science paper in the sense that you're going to have competing theories that are going to be tested on a case related to China in order to determine which is the more valid theory. And then we're going to try to generalize that those findings from that correct theory to other cases. Now, pure scientists often ridicule the social sciences as being imprecise. It's true the chemists and the engineers, they go into a laboratory, they're able to make very precise predictions about energy release from a reaction, or even probabilistic predictions about the strength of certain materials. Now, this is all true, but there's a very different uh, subject that is being studied by physical versus social science scientists. Social scientists, like yourself, look at society. Society is made up of constituent humans. Humans have choice and humans interact with each other in very, very complex ways. So where the physical scientists are looking at micro problems and they have various formula to predict outcomes like the weather that occur within a certain range, we actually don't have anywhere near the same level of knowledge about how humans interact in society, which is, it's a much newer object of study, and it's in many ways a lot more complex. The kind of issues that we solve in the social sciences are the rise and fall of the great powers, wars, great depressions, revolutions, and other social changes and uh, creation of political institutions. In fact, most pure scientists generally propose oversimplified solutions to complex global problems like for example, world government. There's an article written uh, quite a few years ago that compared what the physical scientists and the social scientists did in their practice and analogized it to a comparison between clouds and clocks. Clocks are material physical objects with a limited number of parts. If you know how those parts interact and what their location is at any given time, you can make a prediction on the outcome of what that device is going to be doing. Clouds, on the other hand, are more like human society. They're real. They don't violate physical laws. They have a fixed mass, a fixed number of atoms. They're moving at a fixed velocity. But as they go through the sky, they can change their shape dramatically in response to pressure and wind and other um, uh, objects in the sky. Society is like a cloud. You have individuals who can interact with other individuals in enormously complicated ways, making predictions very, very complicated. And this is why the social sciences tends to rely heavily on statistics. But the big limitation is data, where the physical scientists can go into a laboratory and run an experiment an unlimited number of times. In the social sciences, we can't. We can't take a country and stick it in a laboratory and run it. It would be considered unethical and it would also be very expensive. So we have to go into the history books and look for cases and try to measure those cases. And this is often under circumstances where the cases happened a very long time ago, or even if they're happening today, they happen very infrequently. Wars, for example, between countries, which tend to be very destructive, occur quite rarely. There's always a war between two countries happening somewhere, but if you were to total up the number of wars since Napoleon, which is over 200 years, 
uh, you're looking at less than 100 conflicts. So we don't have enough data in order to run the type of analysis that the physical scientists do. And we could certainly go to the data before Napoleon, who was defeated in 1815, but uh, that data is generally inaccessible. It wasn't uh, examined with uh, uh, um, in mind to search for the type of data that we would need. You know, specific information regarding population, the economy, um, the, the harvest, that information is simply not available. So it's very, very difficult for the social scientist to make an analysis when compared to the physical scientist, but the social scientists look at the big problems. And that is why governments fund the social sciences, because a society will not uh, uh, fall uh, if one particular physical experiment doesn't work. But societies do fall for lack of institutions or a lack of a legitimate uh, political system. So uh, it, it, the social scientists examine something which is important but intractable. Now there was a Hawthorne experiment which gives you an idea of how complicated it is when you're, when, when you're interacting with the humans that you're studying. There was a factory where telephone components were being assembled and there was a hypothesis by a scientific uh, crew that increasing the lighting for the workers uh, would create a net increase in productivity. Although the electricity for the lighting would increase, worker productivity would compensate. So they went into a factory, they interviewed the workers, they turned up the lights and yes, uh, productivity continued. Then they interviewed the workers again, they turned the lights up again, and the workers improved their work efficiency even more. And then as a final test, before they were gonna finish the experiment, they turned the lights down, expecting the workers to decrease their efficiency, but to their shock, even with the lower lights, the worker efficiency went up again. And the, what, what was happening was the workers were interacting uh, and reacting to the interviews that were being conducted with the researchers. So uh, this was un not predicted by the researchers and of course it polluted the uh, scientific uh, findings, their claims that increased lighting affected uh, worker efficiency. So you can see how difficult it is to actually conduct uh, social scientific analysis in part because humans are very complicated and not easily predicted in their behavior because uh, not only the variation between individuals but also the communities that the individuals find themselves in. Epistemology. How do you know what you know? The main problem for the social sciences is once we analyze a problem and we come up with conclusions, we then want to use the policy recommendations to influence leaders and decision makers and policy makers. And they turn around and ask us, how do we know the information you're providing is real? That it's a valid representation of nature. So this is why we use the scientific method. The scientific method is meant to establish a valid epistemology so that the information that we're transmitting uh, can win confidence that, it, uh, that it's an actual representation of the object that we're studying. You can see here the three leaders that came after Mao Zedong, who was one of the founding members of the Communist Party and was the communist leader until 1976. There was first Deng Xiaoping on the left, followed by Hu Jintao, who completed two five-year terms, and then Jiang Zemin, who completed another to five-year terms as leaders of communist China. Now there are two sources of information. The first is deduction. This is axiomatic reasoning where we have a bunch of postulates which are if-then statements and we draw conclusions from them. It uses internal consistency criteria for validation. In other words, it's like mathematics. It's got a set of rules and the rules are not supposed to contradict each other. And we can create further knowledge by elaborations on those initial rules. For example, if we believe that morale of the soldiers matters for winning battles, we therefore have to ensure that soldiers have good morale before they're going to embark in a battle if we want to win. Right? That is a logically consistent statement about 
prior conditions and therefore what should be done. Another source of information is induction. This is empirical reasoning. It's drawing conclusions from observed behavior. This is, uses the external consistency criteria, criteria for validation. So here, you have no preconceived logical notion of something. You go into nature, you see something, you record it, you look at the behavior of that thing, you record its behavior, and that becomes information. So you're collecting information from nature. The word empirical means knowledge obtained through research from nature. Very often, the analogy used to compare deduction and induction is to compare Plato and Aristotle. Plato was Aristotle's teacher, but Plato was also an important uh, Greek philosopher, and he had a theory of language and uh, called the, the theory of language forms. And this was a deductive theory about where ideas came from and how they were attached to real objects in nature. Plato never went out of his academy. He thought this while sitting in his office, contemplating the nature of, of language communication and objects. Aristotle, on the other hand, had a theory about a common origin for all living things. He cut open animals and observed that the fetuses of frogs, horses, pigs, dogs, uh, humans, even fish, uh, all resemble each other in the early stages of development. And while he didn't have a theory of evolution or natural selection, he did postulate that it was possible that all animals came from the same common living original being. Now, he didn't deduce this. He went out into nature, cut open the things, and then made the observation after the fact. Now, we typically use deduction when we have difficulty observing nature. We would, in the case of China's Communist Party, not being able to go to China uh, for fear of being arrested, we would use existing theories that we develop by looking at other countries that had similar types of political structures, and then using the models we created for those to try to have an insight into what we think is going on in China based upon the limited information that we can get our hands on. Now, we use induction when we're not sufficiently confident of the underlying causal logic of the phenomenon we're observing. So if, if we actually have no theory about what it is for uh, the world's uh, most populous or second most populous country to undergo a regime transition from totalitarianism to authoritarianism, uh, you know, then uh, we'd have to start afresh because there's no prior example of this happening. And so we would go to China and measure things and just watch what's happening. And then once it's over, we would record it. So deduction and induction matter for the student because you're going to use both. Now, formally, deduction comes before induction. And the logic for that is that all things can be described as facts but those descriptions require prior theories. So if you were to talk about a shirt being red, we, we, would, we would be tempted to think that red is a fundamental character of nature, but we know that red is really an illusion. It's an illusion created by our optical system that's recorded in our brain that gives it that attribute. But really, it's an analogy of light waves that are interpreted by our neural network and its sensors. So no fact is fundamentally real. All facts require a prior model. So you're supposed to start with deduction and from that proceed to a test. And then you can use that deducted facts to then create an inductive model of reality. Now, as students, you're probably not going to actually do that. You're probably going to think, I want to write a paper about this topic because I think it's very, very interesting. And that's inductive thinking. And then we're going to sit down and try to reverse engineer it to make it sound like that uh, there's actually a deductive framework that preceded it. Uh, so there, you know, there's, a, there's a bit of, of human nature fighting the 
scientific method. The scientific method requires us to be deductive first and then inductive, but as humans, we're going to be inductive and then we're going to reverse rationalize it into a deduction. And that is perfectly okay. So, a theory. A theory is a possible explanation of events. And it's important because it's going to provide the eight elements of a theory applied in your paper. And so you're going to go and apply all of these eight elements that we're going to look at in your paper. Here you can see Qin Shi Huang Di on the left, who was the first Chinese emperor. But as you'll see in the uh, readings and the lecture notes, China's imperial system had already been evolving for uh, hundreds of years. And so he, he wasn't really the first emperor. Uh, he was just identified as the first emperor by later emperors for the purposes of legitimacy. On the extreme right, you can see Han Wu Ti, who made an enormous contribution to China's self-identity and consolidated uh, what was a much messier imperial system under Qin Shi Huangdi. The picture in the center are Canadian soldiers, uh, one of whom was my student, and two People's Liberation Army soldiers from mainland China in Canada on an exchange. So the first element of a paper, the research question or the puzzle. So a research question could be something like, under what circumstances do states build nuclear weapons? Or why do wars happen? Now a puzzle, however, is a lot more compelling. And we want puzzles, not research questions. And so for your paper, I want you to take your research question and reformulate it into a puzzle. If nuclear weapons are so effective on the battlefield, then why are they not used more often? Or, if all states should prefer to win wars, why did the U.S. pursue policies that brought about defeat in Vietnam in the 1960s? Right. So here you have a puzzle. The puzzle is, is, is provoking you to solve it. And so that's what you want to do. You want to have a research question that provokes you, the researcher, and the reader of your scientific paper. Counterintuitive theories are the best ones. They're the ones that challenge the conventional wisdom. And these are the most interesting. Do not be afraid that you will fail when you challenge the conventional wisdom. In challenging the conventional wisdom, uh, you call into question fundamental assumptions, some of which are very often not explicitly observed. So it, it's a very good heuristic device for provoking thought. For my papers, if you challenge a conventional wisdom idea with a counterintuitive theory and you fail, that is, that is still a very good paper. Uh, papers are not judged ever, ever by whether or not their favored theory wins out or not against the conventional wisdom. The papers are graded according to how well they implement the scientific methodology. There are a great many very well-structured, famous papers uh, in which the, the alternative explanation uh, failed uh, in challenging conventional wisdom. You can see the terracotta warriors on the bottom left. This was a, a terracotta army. It was uh, actually influenced by Greeks that were located in Kashmir, a leftover uh, garrisons from Alexander the Great's advance into northern India, uh, which occurred uh, around the same time, about well, it occurred about a, 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 almost a century earlier. And these warriors were meant to protect Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb, which is in Xi'an in China. And the tomb still has not been excavated. It's fascinating. And there are uh, uh, fascinating descriptions of rivers of mercury uh, in a model of China in his tomb, but uh, no one has dug his tomb up, and it's it's the the, the mountain uh, that it was built over has has that was built over it has since uh, shrunk a bit, but it's completely visible and and visitable to tourists. 
And you can see on the uh, right side the Great Wall of China north of Beijing, which was intended to stop the uh, barbarians, the, um, the Mongols and the Manchus and other nomadic peoples of uh, Manchuria and uh, Mongolia. And ultimately, it, it wasn't very successful, and it cost an enormous amount of money, and it drew uh, much of the silver out of uh, the Spanish Empire's um, South American silver mine at Potosi, Bolivia, uh, into China. The second element of the scientific paper is the literature review. So you start with a literature review of the current hypotheses. What do most people think about a particular issue or a particular problem? So you want to start by specifically identifying their hypotheses. A hypothesis is a statement predicting the relationship between variables. In other words, an economic collapse will reduce the legitimacy of the government. Sort of an if-then statement. If this happens, then that is going to follow. We always want to have explicit hypotheses that are very clear and very simple and well-defined and well-measured uh, and very precise so everybody knows what we're talking about and there's no confusion. Now, ultimately, we can't test theories because when we're talking about a theory, we're talking about a general relationship and we want to break a theory down into the subcomponents that are much more precise hypotheses. When we have a very precise if-then hypothesis, we can then test that. We can find a case where we can see whether or not the if-then statement the hypothesis predicts actually occurred or not. So there are six activities we can do in the literature review. The first is to survey previous hypotheses and explanations and predictions. So do a lot of reading. Go to the library, download books and articles. What were the previous hypotheses? What did they predict? These don't always agree. There might be different classes of previous hypotheses or conventional wisdoms. But you want to survey it to just have a, a, a general idea of what is being argued and what do most people believe and why do they believe it. The second step is to highlight the important or crucial cases that remain unexplained. Are there large exceptions? Are there cases that didn't seem to follow the trend? Are there cases that reject the if-then statement? It would be nice if a new theory could explain that exception, so it could broaden the model so that you could make an if-then hypothesis that then reincorporates that novel, anomalous case back into the general explanation. The third step is to identify contradictions or puzzles in the current theories. Are there ideas that make no sense within the deduction of the theory, where the theory contradicts itself? You could speculate, for example, that uh, democracy is more peaceful. Uh, when countries have democracies, they're more peaceful domestically. They're also more peaceful in their relationship with other countries. On the other hand, if you look at the history of democracies, many of the democracies were established through tremendous violence. Not only revolution against an illegitimate uh, prior regime, typically a monarchy or an empire, but also civil wars. So how do societies engage in so much violence and then create a political system that is so stable? Uh, and that's an interesting contradiction about uh, the appropriate use of violence and when it when it persists in the political culture and when it disappears. So it's, it's useful to identify these contradictions. Four, highlight the weaknesses of the previous theories. The literature review is not where you're showing off how much you read. It is an assassination. You are going into the conventional wisdom to highlight the weaknesses, to show how they're wrong and to attack, attack, attack. Once you've shown the weaknesses and you show that there's something that's not working, that's where you can make your contribution. Number five, boldly challenge the conventional wisdom. The idea that, um, uh, for example, industrialized populations are the most intelligent uh, 
and uh, the most stable and uh, you, you have the most legitimate regimes um, when you've got um, a high IQ in the society, this may not always be true. You could challenge that and go, no, there, there are societies that are less stable that have higher IQs. And you could you know, postulate the idea that uh, as people have higher levels of education, their tolerance for corruption goes down. Uh, where people of low levels of education tend to be more accepting of corruption, but when they observe it, perhaps they're more explosive. I mean, certainly there's a lot of, lot of complexity there. But the point is, take a commonly held assumption. For example, uh, China is going to replace the U.S. Or China is vulnerable to climate change. Or China's democracy uh, can come in 50 years. It doesn't have to come tomorrow. There's no compelling social drive for it to democratize soon. You can attack all of those ideas. Step six, identify the cases most commonly used to test the current theories. Right? We need to do this because later on, we're going to talk about crucial cases. It's a very complicated counterintuitive approach to generalizing uh, from uh, uh, testing in order and then and then uh, applying the theory to other cases. And this is where it starts. So it might be confusing at the moment, but if you continue with the lecture, it'll become much clearer. So make a list of the favorite cases of the conventional wisdom. These we call easy cases. We need to identify the easy cases because we're going to use them later on. And we don't want to choose cases that we like or that our alternative explanation or competing explanation likes. What we want to do is identify the cases that are the favorite cases of the conventional wisdom. So make sure you don't confuse those two cases, the conventional wisdom's favorite cases and your favorite case. All right. We don't want your favorite case. We want the favorite case of the conventional wisdom. The third element of a theory. So you've completed the lit review, and now you want to take an inventory of a list of the hypotheses of the current theory. So here we want to specify the predictions and the explanations of the current hypotheses. We would make a list. Now an explanation is the mechanic. How does it come to be? So if we want to look at wow, how a law is passed, you know, we could, we could say, well, there's, there's an idea that's given to the politician by their constituents or by business people or by the media or by an obvious need. They then sit down with lawyers and they write up the legislation and then share it with the party leader. And they then, uh, if the party leader says okay, and if they have a majority in the legislature, they'll then uh, table it and then it'll go to a, a, a first vote and then it'll be taken into committee and then a second vote and taken into committee and then a third vote and it'll be passed and it'll be signed either by the, if it's a bicameral system, by the, the upper house, the Senate, or it's going to go to a governor general or a, an equivalent head of state. So that's, you know, it, it, there's no predictions being made. It's sort of a step-by-step -step process, very mechanical, very long, very tedious, very often boring. A prediction is an if-then if statement, it's much more precise, and it's meant for testing. So in an if-then statement, we would say, Laws are likely to be passed if, A, the government has a majority, B, there's enough money for whatever expenditures expected by the passing of the, of the law, and um, three, the law is ideologically compatible with the party that controls most of the votes uh, in the legislature. So with the if-then statement, we can test that because we can see if the prediction is going to happen based upon the variables that cause it to happen or not. But with... Um, an explanation, we're not testing anything, but we have a rough idea of what the mechanical parts are. Now you could test, you could have predictions for these tiny little mechanical parts that occur within the explanation. It could get quite complicated and quite tedious. Generally, um, we, we can't make an explanation very often if we don't observe the phenomenon. So if we're looking at political party and policy decisions in the Communist Party of China in Beijing, particularly selecting it, the, the, the new Politburo members, um, uh, uh, every time there's a, a Congress, uh, that in, under those circumstances, you know, we can't see what's going on. So we have a rough approximation for the explanation, but we can still make uh, predictions. The reason we want explanations is it helps us figure out uh, what our predictions are going to be. Uh, furthermore, uh, it, it gets a bit banal if you have an if-then statement and we have no idea how the decision is being made. Uh, for example, uh, would China 
conquer Taiwan or not, attempt to conquer Taiwan or not. Well, that depends on the discussions occurring within the military committee within China and within the Politburo. And it's, we don't really know how the decisions are made. We don't know if, if, the, if it's very personalistic or if there's a bureaucracy that's looking at it. We don't know what the variables are. We have some very, very simplified predictions based upon um, the assumptions of strategic studies for other uh, circumstances that are similar, like deterrence theory, but we don't know what the explanation is for that. Now, there are two warnings, two things you should not do. Number one, do not use a straw man argument. These are arguments that are deliberately too easy to be falsified because they're designed to provide an easy, crucial case for you. All right, so you're not allowed to do that. An example would be, war is caused by evil men. Uh, but, you know, God, this is so easy. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, there are people we don't like. They start wars. But we look at them, we inevitably find that evil, first of all, does not exist. This is a religious concept. It's no longer a valid description of humans in the social sciences. You might have cruel men, violent men, uh, but evil just does not exist. It, it makes an appeal to uh, a moral behavior of a religious standard that is, you know, f uh, uh, a fairly consistently, consistently outside of, of the uh, methodological domain of the social science. So if you were to propose this as the conventional wisdom, it's too easy to falsify it. It's too easy to say, well, no, of course war is not caused by evil men. It's caused by this person who had a particular motive to do this, albeit very violent. So you can't do this. You cannot have this easy, uh, crucial case where you take a uh, you take a, a, a case uh, and then um, you you take this particular argument and then you falsify it. It's too easy. We want you to to attack the real conventional wisdom, the sophisticated conventional wisdom, the conventional wisdom that most people believe. Second, do not is do not use tautologies. A tautology is a non-falsifiable assertion, okay? The example here is, war is caused by people who want war to happen. Um, it's, it's completely absurd, obviously. Um, I guess you could, you could speculate that there are cases where war happens uh, because, uh, you know, by accident, and so there was no intention to have the war. But at some point, someone somewhere had to pull the first trigger and fire the first bullet and cross the line, and, and then the war ensued. So th the reason this is a tautology is it's not falsifiable. There's nothing in here that we could prove is uh, incorrect. So um, uh, any, any if-then statement you come up with has to have a falsifiable component. It can't be true by definition. Right, so to, to de-tautologize this, you want to go to the prior cause. All right, you know, war is caused by people who want war, war to happen. What caused them to want war to happen? All right, and you're, you're going to start getting variation there. Because some people are going to go, I want to go to war for this. And other people are going to go, I don't want to go to war for this. And then you're going to have at least some variation. And you can sort of lock down on that and then try to make a prediction uh, based on that. Step four. The proposed improved alternative hypotheses. This is where you make your contribution. You're going to make up, make up an alternative hypothesis or an alternative theory to challenge the conventional wisdom. Again, you are not graded by how successful your alternative explanation is. You're graded by how successfully you implement the social scientific methodology to the problem that you're looking at in your paper. So we want this sort of boxing match where you're the referee between the conventional wisdom and the alternative explanation. So you've seen the weaknesses and the shortcomings of the conventional wisdom and you're going to do better. You're going to say, you know what, I have a new theory which I'm going to test. Now this theory does not have to succeed. Again, that's not how you're graded. But if it's a plausible, well-constructed theory, and it tries to solve some of the problems or try to explain some of the cases that are unexplained, then it's, then it's completely valid. Now, a couple of important things. You want to provide predictions, what will happen under what circumstances, as well as explanations, which is what mechanically causes it to happen. 
So you've got to provide both. Ultimately, of course, you'll be turning your predictions into if-then statements that you can then test to see if they occur in the case. Again, counterintuitive theories and ones that oppose the conventional wisdom tend to be the most interesting. You also have to specify the scope conditions of your hypotheses. Now, what are the limits of the theory that you're using? What can it explain and what can it not explain? I'm generally of the view that humans are pretty much the same everywhere, although historical, environmental, institutional, uh, cultural factor, religious factors do shape people in ways that are important. Most of the social science theories that explain the behavior of people in states and regimes in the world should also apply to China. Now, there might be a subset of theories that help explain China specifically because of China's specific historical experiences. But I, I know generally the scope conditions for your theory are, this applies to all countries, but because I'm focusing on countries that are still communist at the beginning of the 21st century, it particularly applies to countries like China. You know, and Cuba and North Korea, you know, other uh, and Laos, uh, Vietnam, other countries that are that are uh, communist and were communist during the 20th century. Uh, the, the reason we want to do this is there are sometimes countries that that have no application at all. Um, uh, so the theory, the, a theory, for example, of military government has never applied to Canada, even in times of war. There's been civil leadership in Canada. So theories, Canada is just outside of the scope conditions of any theory that makes predictions about military governments, because we've never had a military government. All scientific tests are ultimately competitions between the hypotheses, predictions, and explanations of rival theories. So that's what a scientific paper is. It's not a comfortable description of a literature review. It's you identifying the weaknesses in the conventional theories, you coming up with your own better theory, and then you go and look for a case to test it on. Now, in, in this class, of course, you're gonna be testing it on China. And ultimately, what you wanna do is to formulate a set of generalizable hypotheses. Uh, we're social scientists. We're not only writing about China. So you're gonna come up with covering laws that apply to groups of cases, which are ultimately the goal of every social scientist. So you should have at least two or three sentences on, well, this is, this is the fate of the conventional wisdom and my theory that I tested on China. What does, uh, to what other cases can we apply this to besides China? What are the other countries in the world that this applies to? Now, this is very important. It's very important because, again, a red shirt is not really red. Red is an illusion created by our neural system in order to categorize the different frequencies of light that we see in nature. So we have to be deductive. We have to come up with a theory first, and then we have to come up with uh, the facts that follow from the theory. We can't start with facts. So your paper must first be deductive. And then when it does the case analysis, it's inductive. So when you're writing your theory, your theory, in section three and section four, well, in, in section three, you'll identify the hypotheses of the conventionalism, and in, in four, you're gonna re react to those weaknesses. You must not refer to the case you're testing on. So do not talk about China or about uh, the case that you're gonna test it on in your theory section. I know it's very confusing. How on earth, how on earth would you do that? Well, you have to be abstract. Instead of saying, uh, when there's lots of people demonstrating in Beijing, it's going to lead to the overthrow of the Communist Party. You would say, when, there's a, when there are many revolutionary social movements that are spilling into the streets of a country, the totalitarian regime is going to be under threat of being overthrown. You have to abstract it. If you don't, uh, you are committing a tautology. The reason you're committing a tautology is you've got this idea of China. You create a theory that describes China, and then you're testing the theory back on the case where it came from, which is China. It's completely circular. If it's circular, you're not gonna be able to generalize your theory to China at different times or to other countries besides China, which is what you're supposed to be doing as a social scientist. So do not talk about China when you're discussing the model that you're proposing. 
All right, as, as disconcerting as it is, most of you will try to do that and I'm gonna stop you and make you resubmit your proposal. So, you are allowed, however, to refer to other historical cases that helped you develop the theory, that might have inspired you. So you could talk about you know, developments in ancient Rome, uh, in Persia, in Mexico, in Indonesia, in Russia, whatever uh, you want to use that for. But you just can't refer to the case you're going to test on. But you can refer as examples in an unsystematic, unstructured way, just for inspiration purposes. You could say, well, people in the streets, when they're angry, they're going to demonstrate just like they did in New Delhi on this particular date. Element number five of a theory, the identification of the variables and their operationalization. So you know what a hypothesis is. It's a, essentially a very structured if-then statement. If you observe certain facts, then certain outcomes are going to follow. Those facts we want to measure, and we measure them using indicators. Scientists have things like weight and mass. Economists focus on things like money, unemployment rate, interest rates. Domestic political scientists very often focus on votes. In international relations, we focus on power and legitimacy. These are very hard to measure. I mean, how much power does a country have? The US in the 1960s had an enormous nuclear arsenal, and yet, uh, they, they couldn't pay the price of the war and they were effectively defeated in Vietnam and they left. And the U.S. also left Afghanistan despite having an enormous amount of military power. So power is relational. It, it's a relationship one country has with another and it's difficult to measure if you don't have this relationship. And you end up with all these paradoxes where powerful countries basically are not able to achieve their goals when competing against weaker countries. Legitimacy is also very difficult to measure. Why do people support a certain type of political system? Over time, it erodes under certain circumstances. Un under other circumstances, it becomes more stable. It's one of the most difficult things to understand in political science. The US, US and, and the world communities attempt to build a modern Afghanistan before the Taliban uh, came and took it over in 2021 was an attempt to create legitimacy for Kabul. And they failed. They didn't understand how to create legitimacy. Nevertheless, we want to somehow measure these things, even, even when they're difficult to measure. There is no fundamental solution to this. You as a social scientist, have to figure it out. There's no book that says this is the indicator for legitimacy. So going back and quoting uh, Plato and Aristotle and, and some uh, medieval uh, geniuses, um, you can do that to inform yourself, but you don't have to follow their definition. You are empowered in this class when you create your own models, which by the way, you don't have to have any citations for. Don't plagiarize. I mean, if someone's come up with a theory before, refer to them. You're allowed to have an alternative explanation that was already developed by someone else, but you're also allowed to come up with your own theory that has no references at all. Not a single citation, not a single book or article where it came from before. But all of these must be indicated. You have to measure all of the parts of the if-then statement. If a decrease in Chinese power will lead to a decrease in the legitimacy of the Communist Party, you have got to tell us what power and legitimacy are. Ultimately, we're creating a model. A model is a simplified representation of reality. It's what we call operationalized theory. Operationalizing something, a, a variable, is when we look for indicators. We try to take an idea like a loss of power leads to more legitimacy, and we want to give those numbers. Uh, now, if we're doing statistics, we can get very precise, but for the social sciences, you know, we want to use a cutoff value, which is, you know, if it's more than this, it's a lot. If it's less than this, it's a lesser amount. So if, if let's say, if half of the Chinese population was on the street demonstrating, uh, we could use the indicator of half. If it's more than half, it's a lot. If it's less than half, it's less. And then we go to our case and we ask ourselves, how much of the population of this town went into the street to demonstrate? 
right? That's what operationalization is. It's to, it's to have a sort of a, a quasi simplified mathematical way of measuring the variables with indicators. Okay, now a model, it's a simplified representation of reality. Uh, we live in a very complicated universe. Even now, the gravitational pull of Pluto is affecting us. Now, it's affecting us at an incredibly low level. So we don't even, we're not even able to detect it. But the fact is, it's there. And all the stars we can see in the universe are also affecting us. There are huge numbers of uh, variables that affect every single thing we do. However, as social scientists, we don't want to become overwhelmed. We have to simplify it in order to make it tractable so that we can manipulate the variables to make predictions. So typically we have only three variables. We go for a big variable that probably explains about 30% of the variance, and then a second variable that explains 25%, and then a third variable that's 10%, and all that together is around 65%. And then we have 35% we don't explain. We can't explain because it's too complicated or the, the variables at that point get really small, like 5%, 2%, 1%. It's just not worth our effort. So for your paper, you have to have three independent variables. No more, no less. Three for the conventional wisdom, three for the alternative explanation. And you're going to see that on the proposal that you have to submit uh, to me. Right. So uh, uh, a simplification of reality is... Uh, not only required, it's desirable. It's just too difficult for us to uh, understand how reality works with all the variables, even when we have computers. Because computers let us do the math more quickly. But the math that we're putting into it, which is typically uh, linear regression statistics, if we're doing statistics, that whole math uh, is data starved because we just don't have that much data, even though we've been uh, uh, collecting good government records for uh, about, about half a century. So we can start off with looking at a model. So these are some of the terms you need to be aware of when looking at a model. It's the notation. Now a model, again, it's a simplification, right? So we're cutting off at the causal path at some point. So we start here with the cause. Now, we don't use the word cause because there's a big philosophic debate over what exactly is a cause. And there are you know, some philosophic arguments that causes don't exist at all or they're not detectable. So we use a different terminology, which are variables. A variable is something which varies. All right, It's got values that go up and down. Something which does not vary is the curvature of the Earth. All right, The Earth is round. It's been round for a very long time. Using the fact that the Earth is round to predict the weather is going to fail because the Earth is always round. It's round in the morning, it's round at night, but weather changes all the time. So how can something which doesn't change affect something uh, which changes all the time? So clearly, clearly, we do not want constants. A constant is something that doesn't change. We want variables. So we want things like things that make people angry and spill out onto the street and demonstrate. Right? If, if something is going uh, well, they're not going to demonstrate. If something is going very poorly, they're going to get upset and they're going to go onto the streets and demonstrate. That is a variable. We call it an independent variable because we arbitrarily cut off what came before. Now, we, we actually don't just care if people are demonstrating in the streets. We want to know why are they demonstrating in the streets. Well, they're demonstrating in the streets because of high inflation. Okay, fine. So what caused the inflation? Well, it could be the bad policies of the government. All right, so why does the government have a bad policy? Well, it could be because the, the current ministers weren't that well educated, right? We could just keep going back and back and back and back and back at, to the point where we're basically lost. We generally don't want to do that. So we call this variable independent because we arbitrarily make it simple by chopping off all the events that occurred earlier. So frankly, I would chop it off at inflation. There was high inflation. The people got upset, they went onto the street to demonstrate. We're not going to go before that. It doesn't benefit us as social scientists. We could if we're interested in the education of the ministers, but um, uh, mo most of the time we're not. So what do independent variables, which are causes, affect? Well, they affect the effect, which is the outcome, right? Causes uh, cause something to happen, like the high inflation rate and the effect is people on the streets. But again, we don't use the word effect. We don't use the word outcome. We use the same language that people do in psychology, physics, 
engineering, chemistry, uh, it's all the same. It's independent and dependent variables. It's cause and effect. A dependent variable depends on, of course, the independent variable. Right? That's what we call a dependent. And the variable, of course, it varies in values. The people don't have to be out on the street. They could be at home quite happy, but no, they're out on the street. So here we want to measure it, how many people are on the street, right? Um, how, how unhappy they are by how many placards they brought out. How loud are they? Are they throwing anything? Is the riot squad having to be out there to protect public property? Now, sometimes we want to use intervening variables. An intervening variable is a variable that goes between the cause and the effect. For your paper, you do not have to use it. But there are some very interesting intervening variables. When the Great Depression hit in the early 1930s, impacting on the politics of most of the developed and industrialized countries, it had drastically different political effects depending on the type of institution. In the United States, you had a pretty vibrant democracy with a first-past-the-post system, or a, basically a, a system where you vote for people in a particular district, and the individual in the district, district who has the most votes, or the plurality of votes, uh, gets elected. Now, this, this compels a political party. If they want to win, they have to have a common platform, and then they have to appeal to a very broad range of the population. Because you've got to win in all these different districts throughout, throughout the land. And this is the system that you have in places like Canada and the United States. Or, or say, the democracy uh, in England. Now, uh, when, the, when the Depression hit in the U.S., people voted for the party that provided them uh, the most relief. And this, this was the party of the Democrats, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he was the uh, president um, uh, throughout the 1930s during the, uh, this, this worst period for the uh, U.S. And the result were various welfare and public works operations where unemployed men were put to work on highway projects and other public projects. Uh, and the government paid the money. And it stabilized the economy and helped reestablish uh, confidence in the market. In Germany, you had a system um, where the number of votes would go to a party. And the party would have a list of candidates. And the candidates, um, depending on the percentage of the vote that they got from the population, would then uh, give these representatives a seat in the legislature. So the incentive in Germany was, you know what, if you have a, a party that's an extremist party, um, a, uh, one with a foreign policy that was very aggressive or uh, was, was very extreme in its uh, uh, social welfare policies, then uh, you, know, you, you had an incentive to run. And if you got 5% of the vote, then you got two or three of your candidates in the legislature. In the US, if you had an extreme party they would get three or four percent of the vote, but that was always spread out throughout the country. So that in a particular district, you only got one percent. You need not one percent of the vote. You need you need 30, 40, 50 percent of the vote in a district to get a candidate. So all the extremist parties were, were essentially um, not incentivized to run uh, in the U.S. You have political movements, social movements, parades, but they couldn't become a political party. In Germany, you had extreme parties like the Communist Party and the Nazi Party who could run and were incentivized and could put people into seats in the legislature and then they could influence policy. So the Great Depression in the United States created welfare politics. The Great Depression in Germany because of a different political system, the way that votes were counted, led to an extreme party in power with a very aggressive foreign policy which in the case of the Nazis under the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler led to World War II and a tremendous amount of violence. So this is an example of an intervening variable creating dramatically different outcomes on the dependent variable despite having the same independent variable effect, which is this uh, unemployment caused by the Great Depression. So we're looking for correlation. We want to see that when the dependent variable goes up, the independent variable goes down. They're somehow connected. They may not be connected perfectly. You might have to have a lot of movement, uh, 
on the independent variable before something happens on the dependent variable. For example, you might have a very high level of inflation in a country like China, but because the people are afraid of being uh, singled out by the police state, they may not react. Because of the social credit system, they may actually act with a lot of restraint. And so you might take a lot of inflation to get people out on the street, not just a small number. So uh, you know, the, the correlation must be there. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily, um, uh, the dependent variable is not necessarily going to be hypersensitive to motion or variability in the, in the independent variable. Now, you do want to specify uh, in your paper what the relationship is. So what is the relationship between inflation and people demonstrating in the streets? Well, as inflation goes up, the, the number of people demonstrating goes up. So that's a positive relationship because those values go up and down together. So when inflation goes down and the number of people demonstrating goes down, that's still a positive relationship. Even though both even though both even though the values of the indicators for both variables goes down because uh, they go up and down together. Now, a negative relationship is one where you've got it inversely proportional. So, uh, under this circumstance, as the number of police uh, uh, go down, the likelihood of demonstrations goes up. And as the number of police go up, the number of people demonstrating goes down, right? So the negative relationship is an inverse relationship. The, the values of the IV and the, uh, has an opposite effect on the DV. There's still a correlation there, but it's an inverse correlation. And we measure that by saying negative. Now, very simply, the dependent variable is ultimately going to be what it is that you want to explain, right? What is the thing you're looking at? Are you trying to explain? It, it can't be China. Dependent variable can't be China. It has to be democratization. Now, if you're going to talk about democratization, remember, these are variables, right? Variables have to vary. So in other words, as the value goes up, we also want to know what the value would be if it went down. So when we're talking democratization, we're also talking authoritarianism. If we're talking about China going to war, we're also talking about China staying at peace. If we're talking about China having a high growth rate, we're also talking about China having a low growth rate. Right? So you have to be aware that when you're studying something, you're studying the full range of values of that variable. Okay, So you need to be explicit about what the range of values are for all of your variables. So if you want to study, well, is China going to conquer, attempt to conquer the Russian Far East, which the Imperial Russians militarily seized from China and then enforced by treaty in the 1850s and 60s, is, is China going to try to reverse that situation? Well, the outcome is China invades Russia, China uh, uh, just takes a small bit of territory, China complains and asks for reparations, uh, or China does nothing. So there's a range of things it can do, and we have to specify those with indicators, right? Variables must vary. Now, this is a good point to highlight something called the endogeneity problem. This is when a cause is also an outcome of the process being examined. For example, China and the US being involved in an arms race may be a cause for war. But it could also be the cause of interstate hostility. So when we say, well, you know, arms races cause war. China and America are going to build a big fleet, and that big fleet's going to cause a war. Well, no, no. Why does China have a big fleet? Why does the U.S. have a big fleet? Well, there's mutual hostility or suspicion between the two countries, insecurity, and this leads them to building the fleet. So the question then becomes, well, what causes interstate hostility? What caused the security dilemma between China and the U.S.? So uh, whenever you look at, at, a, at a cause, the, the cause might actually be associated with the outcome. 
right? The fact that there's arms race is, is almost the same thing as war. They're not the same thing, but they're both caused ultimately by the same thing, which is this interstate hostility. So whenever you're creating a model, check to make sure there is no endogeneity problem. Make sure that what you're looking at isn't associated too closely with the outcome. Here's a model of war and peace. So in this particular case, we have uh, IV1, which is independent variable one. And here we've got state A and B buying weapons. And presumably it ranges from buying very few weapons to buying many weapons. And you can see it as a plus relationship with war. The dependent variable war here is war slash peace. It's a variable, again, because it depends uh, on the independent variable and it can vary from peace to war depending on whether state A or B buy weapons. Although in this particular case, the assumption is as state A and B buy more weapons, the likelihood of war going up increases. So there's a positive relationship there. We have IV2, the second independent variable. Now again, you notice that they're independent variables because we haven't specified prior causes for them deliberately because we're obviously wanting a simplified model of reality. So here we have hostility, obviously implying interstate hostility. And as hostility goes up, we can see the plus there, it increases the number of disputes. Now dispute is an intervening variable and here we could conceive of it as a maritime territorial dispute or a terrestrial territorial dispute. So in other words, is the dispute happening over water or land? Uh, I, I would you know, arbitrarily speculate that disputes over the water are more likely uh, to happen because the, the consequences are less. You just have a couple of sunk ships where if you start fighting on land, it very quickly escalates because land is very important because it's what people live on. You need water to fish and to do commerce, but you need land in order to farm and actually live. And so land is far more sacred than water. So the, number, the level of hostility increases the number of disputes uh, and the, the type of dispute, whether it's on land or sea, has an effect at amplifying that hostility. And there's a positive relationship between, let's say land disputes are more likely to escalate to war slash peace, which is the uh, dependent variable. There are two types of causes in the social sciences, necessary and sufficient causes. A necessary cause is something that you have to have present in order for the effect to occur. For example, in order to win a battle, you need to have some soldiers. Now that's not a very good example. We would call that example trivial. In other words, it's so obvious, it doesn't need to be stated. If you need the, you know, the obvious ingredients for something to happen, you don't very often need to lead, uh, list those. What we want to identify are necessary causes that are unexpected, without which the outcome could not occur. And it can get a lot more complicated. There's also something called jointly necessary condition. And that's when you've got two causes that have to be simultaneously present for the outcome to occur. In other words, neither of the causes alone is enough for what is going to happen to happen. There's also a sufficient cause. In this case, you can model it with an if-then statement. If this cause is observed, the effect will invariably follow. You know, if your soldiers have greater firepower, they're going to win the battle. Now, in reality, necessary and sufficient causes almost never occur. They, they simply cannot be found. We identify these because we want to identify the type of cause that we think we're describing for when we're trying to describe it to other people, but not because these can be easily modeled. All of the truly necessary conditions are trivial. Like you can't have a war without oxygen. It's very, very obvious. I guess you could have a war in space, but the soldiers there, if you have astronauts, they need oxygen. I guess if you have robots in space shooting each other, they don't need oxygen. But you see where this is leading. It's too obvious to be uh, particularly um, useful. Um, but if we can identify a sufficient cause that's unexpected, then you have the basis for a dissertation in the social sciences. You can see a picture here at the bottom depicting a multinational army. And here you see the Japanese and the English fighting the uh, Chinese during the Boxer Rebellion. 
when the uh, Qing dynasty, which was ethnically Manchu, were basically manipulating Chinese nationalism in order not to be subject to pressure from uh, European countries that wanted their debts repaid. In nature, many of the relationships are actually curvilinear. So we have this assumption that the, the greater the value on the indicator for the independent variable, the greater the outcome for whatever indicator you're using for the dependent variable. But very often, you have too much of something, it then leads to a complete collapse of that thing. For, for example, uh, you could propose that the larger the police force, the more legitimacy the state's going to have. So you have a very small number of police. The legitimacy of the regime is quite low because there's a lot of crime and people are not happy with that. And they want the state to stand up and bring some order to the streets. So you have some optimal level of police. You, you have more, a larger police force. You've got a certain level of stability. And then uh, you can, and, and that brings the, the, the highest level of legitimacy. But if you have too many police and you increase the police force too high, then there's going to be an overregulation of society and there's going to be privacy issues and freedom issues and people will revolt against it and not trust the government. So the optimum level is somewhere in the middle. And this is true of most variables. So we have to be sensitive to that. When we are coming up with models, whether it's in the way that we're describing here or even when we use statistics, uh, it, it's dangerous to have linear thinking. The problem, unfortunately, is is that it's very difficult to test nonlinear models, even in statistics. We're limited by the methodologies. The statistics haven't caught up, and neither have the qualitative methodologies. So the best thing to do is be is to be uh, cognizant of this problem. Now, uh, the the description I have here is sort of uh, a, you know a much simpler one. Here I have uh, students. Uh, uh, rating their performance against stress. So if they if they write a paper for me tomorrow, there wouldn't be stress because the paper would not be due for three months, and therefore the you, you, the performance of the paper, the the quality of the paper would be quite low. If you're writing the paper a month before, the stress level is higher, and that paper is going to get submitted uh, with much higher levels of quality. And then if you submit the paper the night before, the stress will be. Uh, uh, paralyzingly high, you'll be totally stressed and not able to write a good paper and the, the, the quality of the paper will be very low. There are five important methodological pitfalls to be cognizant of when you're working on your paper. The first is do not select on the dependent variable. Selecting on the dependent variable means you focus on one category of the variable. I'll give you an example. We can imagine someone doing a study in the 19th century and they make a long list of victories. And then they look at the color of the uniform of the, of the country that won those engagements and they'll find that they have a red uniform. The policy conclusion is, well, if we want to win a battle, we should wear a red uniform, or at least we should copy what that country is doing that's wearing the red uniform. This would be invalid. This is the problem of selecting on the dependent variable. Just imagine if you looked at both categories, not only at victory, but also at defeat, which are the two categories of the dependent variable, victory and defeat, not just victory. Well, we notice that countries that have red uniforms also lose a lot. So the recommendation to copy whatever the country is doing that has the red uniform would be false. So this is just a reminder to not to be aware that when you look at only one category of the dependent variable and you extrapolate it you could be giving an invalid policy recommendation based upon a biased finding the second issue is to be aware that most of the events that occur in political science are non-events things that didn't happen that you did not observe we could, for example, think of China planning an invasion of Taiwan. China either invades or it doesn't invade. Now, we as political scientists have a problem because we need to figure out how to count or characterize those periods of time when China is not invading Taiwan. Is China not invading Taiwan because they don't want to? 
Or is China not invading Taiwan because they want to, but they're not strong enough? Or because they're being deterred, or they're being opposed, or they're afraid of the risk? This is the problem of non-events, especially when we're looking at relationships between countries, because the act of actually causing a war or having confrontation or having a crisis or a dispute is actually rare. It's quite infrequent, even between very hostile countries like North and South Korea. So then what do we do with this problem of the non-event? Well, uh, it, it's actually up to the scholar, which would be you. You could actually think about it in terms of an explanation and try to come up with a mechanic that explains why or what is happening uh, during those non-event periods. Now, the reason we have this problem is that political decision makers anticipate reactions. In other words, they're not simply a rock that you take and you throw it down a hill and it's going to hit every tree on its way down. If you take a person and you throw them off a hill, they're going to look down the hill and see the oncoming trees and try to avoid them. So leaders, they don't just move around without looking into the future. They're constantly planning ahead and they're calculating, well, if I do this, what happens? And most of the times, politicians realize they have to move slowly. Because even if they want to do something decisive, they've got to collect the support or collect the strength to be able to pull off that policy. And so you want to specify an explanation that incorporates the idea of the anticipated reaction. What precisely is that policymaker looking for, looking at, and what are they reacting to? The third issue are counterfactuals. A counterfactual is alternate history. This is when we're trying to consider conditions of, well, if, if this was a situation, what would the outcome have been? It's very important to look at counterfactuals. Aside from the end of World War II, we've never had a nuclear war. So all of the scenarios we have are fictitious. They're basically made up stories of nuclear wars and we do the calculations to see what the outcomes are, both physically and strategically and diplomatically. So in the case of China, we could say, well, um, if America had to fight a democratic China over Taiwan, would China be stronger or weaker? You see, right there, we have a false counterfactual. Counterfactuals or alternate history must be plausible. It must be something that could actually occur and it has to be co-tenable with all of the other factors in that model. So here you have a democratic country wanting to go to war over Taiwan. Well, China, if it was democratic, would never go to war over Taiwan because Taiwan would never have separated from China. It would be a part of China. So whenever we propose a counterfactual, we have to make sure it's plausible with reality and it's co-tenable with the other variables in the model that we're looking at. And th again, this is a methodological problem that's very similar to the endogeneity problem. We want to look at the common prior cause. Is there a cause earlier on in the causal chain that influenced both the independent variable and the dependent variable, which influenced what kind of government does China have and is China planning on invading Taiwan? The fourth issue that you got to be aware of is avoid constants. In early political science, uh, international relations, one of the earlier constants was human nature, the idea that human nature causes war. Well, uh, Kenneth Waltz, uh, who's one of the premier scholars in international relations, wrote a dissertation and a book on that subject. Human nature doesn't change. It's always human nature. As long as humans are humans, human nature is the same. So how can something which doesn't change, which is a constant, explain variation between peace and war? It can't, obviously. In the case of politics and regime types and institutions in, uh, the, in, in East Asia, we can think of Confucianism, a very important religious and political set of values and a doctrine. We could argue, well, Confucianism uh, explains the type of governments we have in Asia. Now, the problem is, I mean, Confucian, Confucianism comes from a, 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 a sort of a set of codified uh, religious uh, values and philosophic values, but there is an enormous variation in Asia. There are uh, capitalist countries 
uh, that have very few limitations on corporate behavior, which is what Hong Kong had before it rejoined uh, China in 1997. Uh, you have uh, countries like Japan and Taiwan and South Korea where, and Singapore, where the uh, capitalist economy, uh, the companies in the capitalist economy are heavily regulated. You've got communist regimes like China, which re rely heavily on capitalism. Uh, you've got rural communist states like Vietnam and Laos. Uh, you have North Korea, which is a totalitarian uh, state where you've got inherited authority. Basically, it's like a, a, almost a, a monarchical system. So the constant of Confucian values can't possibly ex explain the great variation. So uh, uh, you need to make sure that what you're using to describe an outcome is not a constant, that it varies somehow. Confucianism does not vary. Now, you could argue that there's different types of Confucianism. That might certainly be a way to avoid Confucianism as a constant. And number five, and this is restating an earlier point, theory precedes observation. Deduction comes before induction. You need to specify with the theory what the indicators are before you look at the facts themselves. Remember, a red shirt is not red. It is simply an abstraction, an illusion created by your mind to help categorize a natural phenomenon. Element six of a theory is test design. This is one of the more complicated elements in the social scientific paper. Here we test the different hypotheses. Now it's important to test the competing explanations. Expl competing explanations are rival hypotheses that must either be falsified or tested through competition with one another to see which provides the best predictions and or explanations. Ultimately, we're trying to establish a correlation. In other words, as the independent variable varies in a particular direction, the dependent variable follows as a consequence. Now, correlation is not causation. We establish correlation with our predictions, our if-then statements. We establish causation by showing that there's actually an intricate relationship by examining the explanation. So examining a correlation is never enough. We have to both validate the prediction and then show causation mechanically through the fine-grained process tracing of this thing affecting that thing in order to demonstrate causation. In the pictures below, you can see the Western and Japanese militaries intervening in the Boxer Rebellion. And you can see the boxers themselves, which are the Chinese nationalists trying to throw out the Westerners uh, during the Boxer Rebellion. Can we prove a cause-effect relationship? Imagine you are asked to prove the relationship between the number of people on the street demonstrating as caused by the level of inflation. So the level of inflation is the independent variable and the demonstrations on the streets is the dependent variable. How would you prove it? Well, we could simplify this. Imagine you had a pencil and you held it in the air. Do you have a deductive argument that proves when you let go of that pencil, the pencil will not fall to the ground? Now, I know what you're saying. Well, obviously you let go and the pencil is going to fall because gravity is going to pull it. Okay, but I didn't ask for an explanation. Gravity is an explanation. I asked for a deduction so that logically we know that that pencil is going to fall every single time you let go of it. Now, you can pick up that pencil and drop it five times, 50 times, 500 times, 500 trillion times. And it doesn't mean that after you drop the pencil all those many times, it's not going to drop again. Think about it. Is there a deductive argument that with perfect certainty demonstrates that the pencil will fall when you let go of it? And the answer is no. This is a shock to most people. We can never prove any cause-effect relationship. Consequently, never use the word prove. A proof is 
a description of a logically consistent argument coming out of logic or mathematics or geometry. It's also a term used in law. But in the social sciences, there is no proof. We can never prove a cause-effect relationship in nature. So never, never use the word prove. Never, never use the word prove in your paper or whenever speaking the technical language of the social sciences. We can show correlations, but we can never pro prove a cause-effect relationship. Now, going back to gravity, that's a problem, right? Because you guys obviously coming to class this morning uh, walked in the street with a great level of faith in gravity. Imagine if gravity was variable. Uh, at any moment, it could cancel, and then you'd fly off deep into space. Right? And you came here, however, with full confidence that gravity was going to work. And there's a reason for that. Humans are pattern animals. Our brains look for patterns. One of the explanations for why humans are so automatically religious, or at least more religious than animals, our much bigger brains compel us to look for a cause behind everything, even if it's not there. So we're, we're pattern recognizing organisms. So this is, this is an issue for methodology because the pure logic of methodology is there is no deduction that can prove any cause-effect relationship. It doesn't exist. Now, you're wondering, I paid for all this money to attend a university. Why would I be um, suddenly learning that I can't prove anything? It means I can't accumulate knowledge. It means we're stuck and learning is useless. And the answer, of course, is no. There's actually a solution to this. You can't prove anything, but we can disprove. We can disprove. We can make the argument, if I let go of this pencil, I am going to attempt to disprove the argument that the pencil will not fall. Now, if you do the experiment now, under, the, under current conditions, you let go of that pen or pencil, it'll fall. You've just falsified the argument. And here we have the first bit of knowledge. It's contingent knowledge on a great many things. We extrapolate that knowledge. We say we've come up with the hypothesis that the pencil will not fall. It did fall. Therefore, we're going to assume indefinitely that it's going to continue to fall because we falsified the argument that it's not going to fall until that notion is disproved by the pencil floating in the air when we let go of it. That's how it's done. It's also done like that in statistics. In statistics, you have a null hypothesis which argues that there is no change uh, in the outcome, in the dependent variable from the independent variable, and you're constantly trying to disprove that non-relationship or that non-effect. So there are two principles of falsificationism. The first is max falsification criterion. So under falsification, you cannot prove a theory to be correct, but you can disprove it. So you would set up your hypothesis with indicators, and then you would then look at the case and see if that hypothesis's assertions about the effect of the independent variable and dependent variable are present or not. And if they're not present, then it's falsified. You can also do this probabilistically. In other words, statistics argues the Conventional wisdom is always that there's no relationship and you're trying to falsify the non-relationship. And once you falsify the non-relationship, there must by default be a relationship. It does sound like it's a contortion of logic, but it's very important contortion of logic because we can never prove anything. We can only disprove. So for Mac, Ernst Mac, uh, who's a, a, an early physicist, he argued that because you cannot prove a theory, you have to disprove it. Now, technically, you can't really disprove a theory. What you do is you break the theory into discrete hypotheses with their own indicators, and you disprove these one at a time. So, for example, you can't prove the law of gravity. You know, it'll work 10 million times, but there's no logical reason why it would continue to work. There are no absolute laws. All physical laws and social laws are contingent. So as an example, um, we could have a hypothesis that wars are won because the general has a nice uniform. And we find in a study that there's a victory by a general with an ugly uniform. 
or there's a battle lost by a general with a nice uniform. Therefore, this theory is falsified. Right? And there's two methods of falsification. Either you can falsify it using the available data, which is you find some sort of historical event like China going through a revolution or going through a war, or you can find an alternative theory that exists that explains more. And this leads us to our next criterion. The second criterion is the competing criterion. A theory is good if it explains more than the previous theory. So I'll give you an example. We have a theory, number one, which is that wars are won by superior weapons. Now we go and study this and we find that 60% of battles are won by this independent variable. 40% of battles are won for other reasons. All right. There's a second theory which argues that wars are won by superior training. And in study, we find that 90% of battles are won by this independent variable and 10% 10, 10 of the battles were won for other reasons. Therefore, theory two is better than theory one because it explains more. Okay, here you can see American uh, prisoners of war uh, from the uh, Korean War when the Chinese and Americans fought each other in 1950 and 51. Um, you can see the Chinese deploying in North Korea, and you can see some of the weapons that were used by the uh, communist forces in the Korean War when the American and Chinese armies clashed directly. When you're trying to explain why something is happening in political science, you're going to notice that there are a lot of things happening at the same time. Many of those things of course, everything, everything affects everything, but many of those things are going to have such a minor effect that it doesn't matter and they should be discarded. Many other things will be occurring at the same time, but are actually not causes. They're simply being affected by the same common prior cause. So they look like they're correlating and they are in fact correlating, but there's no causal relationship. So the major challenge in the social sciences is how do you control for the multitude of other causes? And when we say control for, what we mean to say is to identify and then to cancel them uh, and identify them as not being important. That's what control means. When we get rid of all those things that don't matter, what we are left with is those things that do matter. So it's like looking at a big bowl of spaghetti. 90% of the spaghetti strands don't go anywhere. But one spaghetti or two spaghetti strands matter, and we have to sort of separate the two. So we call this the, the Paris Passus or Ceteribus Paribus uh, uh, requirement. It, it's the idea that other things being equal, this is the cause that's affecting the outcome. So we need to measure the effect of a cause, controlling for all of the other causes in order to get a true idea of what's going on. Now, how do you do this? Ideally, if you were not a student in my class, but doing this for the government, you'd have more time and more money, and so you do a complete project. For my class, you're going to have one single case study, not more than one single case study. You simply don't have the time or the length of the paper to have more than one case study. But in an ideal world, if you're doing this professionally, you would want the number of cases necessary to demonstrate variation in your dependent and your independent variables. So you could take uh, a single case and have it go across time and have the independent variable vary between the different categories and have the dependent variable go between the different types of government. Um, or you could choose two different cases occurring at two different times, which again allow for variation of the independent and dependent variables. So if you had, uh, think, think about it, if you had uh, uh, two independent variables, uh, level of inflation and uh, how good the harvest was, for example. And you wanted to examine all the possible combinations. You would have to have a case where there was good harvest and low inflation, one where there was a bad harvest and high inflation, and one where you had a combinations of those, uh, such as a, a high inflation and good harvest and low inflation and bad harvest. So that right there would require four separate cases. Right. And so uh, in the independent variables. And so you could either have four separate cases or one case across a very long period of time that experiences all four of those uh, effects, uh, rather uh, causes. And then you could focus on the effect it has on the independent variable. 
Now recall the model that we looked at before. We have two independent variables going through an intervening variable affecting the dependent variable of war slash peace. Here you've got state A and B buying weapons. Now what we've not done here is disentangled the spaghetti. Do we have a spurious relationship? A spurious relationship is where there's a relationship that we see here that's not real. And it's not real because we didn't fully test this to see whether all of the relationships are real. In other words, they're valid representations of what's actually occurring. So let's speculate. Is there another relationship here that we're not seeing? So here we have our model for arms races. And we see, in fact, there was a relationship we did not consider. It turns out that state A and B buying weapons is a spurious relationship with war and peace. It's not a real relationship. In fact, state A and B buying weapons is an intervening variable. It's an intervening variable between IV2, which is hostility, and war and peace. Well, we know this intuitively. Weapons are very expensive. If you're going to buy weapons, you're going to make sure they're not going to cause a war. People buy weapons that are very expensive when they're very afraid that's when they're willing to pay the taxes in order to build them. So if weapons are being built, there must be a very good reason for it. So hostility is the real underlying cause of this entire model. Hostility is what we would call is the confounding variable because it confounds the earlier model. John Stuart Mill's logical methodology forms much of the basis for the comparative method that we use in the social sciences. You should know the logic behind each of them. He has a number of different methods, but we're only going to focus on two. So here we have John Stuart Mill's method of difference or similar case design. Method of difference. Difference refers to the difference in the dependent variable or the effect or the outcome. So what we have are two cases, student A and student B. We have a multitude of confusing independent variables. And what we're trying to do is identify what is that single variable in this spaghetti of causation that explains the outcome in the dependent variable. So we've got student A and, and student B. Or we could have student A at an earlier time. Right? So it could be the same student at a different time or uh, a different student. So we look at their family structures and they're the same. So that can't explain the difference in their final grades of A plus versus B plus. We look at their money, the money's the same. And we notice that student A studied a lot and student B spent a lot of time watching TV. And that explains the difference in their grades. Uh, in the top corner, you can see a Soviet patrol at around the time of the 1969 uh, Chinese uh, border conflict. Here you see another application of the method of difference. Uh, you, you could imagine uh, France and China is sort of an arbitrary case I made up and whether they're going to go to war. Um, uh, in the particular instances that are being looked at, France and China both didn't go to war for land. They both didn't go to war because of the structure of their governments. It does seem that there were differences between them on ideas that correlated with the wars when the wars actually occurred. And so this tells us that ideas or ideology or political culture mattered more. For example, you could also have China at time zero versus China at time one. Again, you can look at land being in a, a cause of war and structure. And again, you notice that ideas explain the variation, why China was at war at one period and was not at war at another period. And again, the method of differences is a, is a technique used to isolate the variable that is the actual cause from the multitude of other variables. Here we have John Stuart Mill's method of agreement, which is the second technique of his. This is also called the most different case design. When we say method of agreement, you could think of it at looking at the dependent variable or the outcome again, and notice that it's the same for the two cases. But um, ultimately, we're looking at an agreement, of course, uh, between the two cases and between the causes and effects in both cases. So here we've got student A and student B. They have different family structures. Student A's got a big family, student B's got a small family. 
Uh, student A is from a rich family, student B is from a poor family. But when we look at the variable of studying, both studied very hard and that both explained why they got top marks. So again, the method of saveness, it consists of selecting dissimilar cases, cases that are different. So you could compare, say, China and Algeria, and then you isolate the common independent and dependent variables that matter in the causation, and you're able to get rid of or control for those extraneous variables that don't matter, which in this case is like family and money. Now, of course, there's a big assumption. All of these are univariate causes. In other words, there's a single cause here which is do the student study. When in your paper, you're gonna be looking at three independent variables uh, for um, uh, both the conventional wisdom and the alternative explanation. Also, it, there's, there's an assumption here of no interaction effects, which is where in statistics, you have two variables. When combined, they have an exponential impact on the outcome. Here's another application of John Stuart Mill's method of agreement. You can see that, uh, you know, who goes to war for what reason? Uh, humans go to war for gold. Um, uh, humans, chimps, and bongos go to war for uh, tools. Uh, but all of them go to war when there's overpopulation, when you have a large group. And so we assume that uh, having a large group is the cause of war. In the picture up there, you can see a, a monkey attacking a human with a stick. Element seven of the social scientific paper is the case selection, essentially the test data. So there's a problem. If you want to generalize, meaning you want to take the findings that are valid from your alternative explanation and you want to go to a policymaker and go, this is valid information and it applies to many other situations, how can you go about convincing this policymaker that your data is valid? So this is where we make the distinction between easy cases and hard cases and where we get them. And it comes down to essentially, how do you test your theory in such a way that you maximize the generalizability and the validity of your alternative explanation? Now, I showed you earlier when I, when I asked you to prove any logical relationship, I showed you a picture of all of the galaxies in our universe. Now, you can try and test your theory by uh, collecting the money, building a spaceship, and visiting all of those different galaxies. And you'd have to wait for a very long time as civilizations rose and fell. So you'd have to hang around until the end of the universe. Also, you'd need to build a time machine to go back and look at all the civilizations that, that did occur before our present. So that's a problem because you are going to run out of money. The same applies to the social sciences here on Earth. No one is gonna provide you the money. And remember, social science isn't done for fun. It's done because governments were concerned about wars and domestic disturbances. And so they want to accumulate knowledge on how to deal with the problem. So it's, there's a limitation on time and funding. So what we need to do is have a strategy that allows us to create valid evidence without having to examine the full universe of cases. So we want to instead collect a sample of representative cases that we can use. Now there's two approaches here. There are easy cases and there are hard or crucial cases. The picture at the bottom are Russian and Chinese border guards uh, tussling uh, just before their 1969 border war. The first strategy are easy cases cases that easily demonstrate your relationship. You can use this case selection strategy to highlight your model when it would be hard to see the effects in other cases. So if you want to make an argument between military governments and war, then you wouldn't want to test it on something like Canada because Canada does not have a military government. You'd actually want to test it in a case where there is a military government. So it's very useful for clearly seeing what the relationship is of the model. However, it's not generalizable. You're not gonna be able to say, you know what, it works in this case, therefore it's gonna work in other cases. So easy case strategy is when you're trying to uh, get a deeper understanding of how the model would work in the best case scenario. That's why we call it the easy case. 
The picture below is the Chinese tradition of bound feet, which was pursued by the elite in China. It was thought that the daughters of the very wealthy uh, looked prettier with small feet, and so they went through a rather painful process of having their feet bound and uh, reduced in size. I had an acquaintance whose grandmother uh, died about 10 years ago whose feet were bound. So uh, this is not a 19th century thing. Uh, it actually survived into the 21st century, if you can imagine that. The second case selection strategy is the use of hard cases, also called crucial cases. We'll start with an analogy. If you want to sell ice cream, meaning you want to maximize the sale of your ice cream, do you test your product on those who like it or dislike it? Obviously, you're not going to test it on those who are allergic. They're, they're never going to be a market. If you test ice cream on those who like it, well, they're always going to say yes. If you give them good ice cream, they're going to say yes. If you give them mediocre ice cream, they're going to say yes. And if you give them bad ice cream, they're going to say yes. If you give ice cream to someone who dislikes ice cream and they say yes, you don't need to test the ice cream on those who already like it. It's going to save you a lot of time and money. So the case selection strategy is the same thing. You want to test your case on someone who is less likely to support your case, but, meaning a case that's less likely to support the assertions of the alternative explanation, but it's still within scope conditions. In other words, they're not allergic. In other words, you're not trying to test military theory on Canada. Hard cases are least likely cases, or cases that strengthen the alternative explanation. So when we say least likely, we re really mean less likely, because we, we don't want, uh, again, to have a, a, a theory that's applied outside of scope conditions. So let's take, for example, a theory that explains the coming revolution in China that's going to overthrow the communist regime. There are those who like to focus on Eastern Europe. A lot of the writing on regime transition looks at Poland, East Germany, Romania, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia. Other countries like to look at regime change in uh, places like Cambodia, which was communist and then became democratic. Most of the writing is about, um, is about the revolution in Eastern Europe at the, at the end of the uh, Soviet Union and the, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact in 1989. So, you need to convince the policymakers that you have a valid theory. If you go and, and you have this newfangled theory on revolution, so you're going to take your newfangled theory that fits, that you derived by reading a lot of history books on Cambodia, Kampuchea, and you're going to go, you know what, I'm going to go test this theory. You can't test it on Kampuchea, okay? If you do, Everyone's going to go, this is not a generalizable theory, it's sort of tautological. You were inspired by Cambodia, and then you tested the theory from Cambodia back on, on Cambodia. It might do a great job explaining Cambodia. To convince people that your theory is going to work for all the cases, because you want to generalize the theory, not only to your case, but to all the cases uh, that are available on revolution, on, on communist regime collapse, you're going to test it on the favorite case of the conventional wisdom. Now, do you remember when you were identifying the favorite cases of the conventional wisdom? It was way back at the beginning in your lit review. In your lit review, when you're doing the literature review of the conventional wisdom, I asked you to make a list of their favorite cases. Those are their favorite cases. So, in theory, in theory, their, their theories, should the conventional wisdom theories should ideally fit the conventional wisdom's favorite cases of Eastern Europe. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to test your theory on their favorite case. So it's their easy case, but it's your hard case. It's your crucial case. Why is it a hard case? Because it's harder for you to show your theory to work than it is their conventional wisdom theories. If, however, your theory can explain more or better than the conventional wisdom theory in Eastern Europe, then your theory's got generalizability. Because you're going to go, I took this theory, I, I developed it looking at Cambodia's history, I tested it on their favorite case, and they're going to go, they're going to go, holy cow, you know what, uh, uh, you are correct. 
your theory is more convincing, it's more valid, because it not only explains Cambodia, it also explains Eastern Europe, and therefore it might have implications for China. One of the biggest issues in political science is case selection. This is not a problem that's ever very easily resolved. A lot of ink has been spilled. A lot of people write in, and criticize each other's works based upon whether they actually selected crucial cases. So for your paper, you must select a crucial case. You must select a case that is the favorite case of the conventional wisdom and is a less likely case for your model. So how do you falsify or demonstrate causality in a case? Well, first there's variance analysis. So you're gonna show for correlation and you're gonna control for alternative explanations that occur in the case. The second is to compare explanations. And here you're gonna process trace or show the fine grained interaction of variables within whatever process you're looking at. And this is a more convincing way of showing causation. Uh, uh, decision maker X uh, talks to decision maker Y, they come up with, with policy Z, they go through an institutional process M, and it produced the out outcome of N. And so you would show how this works. And it's more convincing than a simple if-then statement, which is black boxed. I mean, we see what the input is, we see what the output is, but we're not entirely sure what the process is. In social sciences, you have to do both. You have to have a, a concise, clear, well-defined if-then statement, and you've got to have the fine-grained explanation. Typically, each independent variable must be individual, individually tested by falsification, as otherwise a theory cannot be refuted uh, in a sense of being disproved if there's more than one independent variable. So one of the problems that we have is called multifinality or the overdetermination problem. Multifinality is when you've got five different variables affecting something, and they all produce this, the same effect. Did the winner win the race because they ate well, because they exercised well, because they have good genetics, because they have good coaching? So we have all these, or, or it was, it was it, you know, it was their, their horoscope came up that day. So we have five different causes all predicting the same outcome. Simple correlation analysis using uh, John Stuart Mill is not going to work. We're actually going to have to get into the fine-grained level to determine, all right, so which is the strongest of these variables? If we have to rank the variables, which is at the top, the most influential, which is the least influential. Probably the horoscope is at the bottom, being the least influential. Good genetics at the top, followed by good coaching, followed by good diet, uh, and you know, and so forth. Uh, this is also called the overdetermination problem. So the overdetermination problem or the multifinality problem is when you've got uh, a, a basically overloaded independent variables all predicting the same thing. The final element of a theory is the evaluation of findings and policy prescriptions. Political science has a goal, but the goal must not bias your study. So you must follow the social scientific method. This is how the papers are graded. And whatever bias you have, whatever political inclination you have, when you're actually writing the paper, you must act like an impartial referee judging fairly the competition between two theories that are competing in their explanation in the test case. You want to evaluate the predictive and explanatory power of the resulting test and recommend subsequent research. So what have we learned and what does this tell us about what kind of research we want to do in the future? You want to report the results and then translate this into actionable policy recommendations. Now, in the university, you're writing papers to exercise writing papers. In government, you write papers because the government needs to get information and they want valid information. And so they're asking for a report to give them the information they need in order to spend public money. So it's a big deal. In your student paper, this is the least important section. In the real world, uh, the policy making world, this is the most important section of the paper. And here you get into the nitty gritty of what do we do, how much money do we spend, what do we focus on. The pictures here are the um, uh, uh, from the Sino-Indian conflict of 1962, October-November, when China attacked India. 
in the Himalayas. And you can see a confrontation between Indian and Chinese troops and the Chinese army, and you can see Indian prisoners being taken. India was soundly defeated uh, by China in uh, two separate assaults as a part of the campaign. So finally, a good theory has five elements that we should add in consideration to all the other things we spoke about. First, it should have leverage. You want to explain as much as possible. So you want to look at important theories and important topics and important cases, and you want your variables to be as strong as possible. Number two, you want a parsimonious theory. In other words, a simple theory. That's why we only have three independent variables. If you were to come to a policy decision maker and go, listen, I've got 17 variables here. Let's go look at this problem. They're going to go, listen, I, I can't handle that many variables. And, and the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh variable, th their effects are going to be so small that it's not worth focusing my scarce time on the effect of these variables. Now, if you're trying to land a spaceship on the moon, obviously, uh, your degree of error is very narrow. You don't want to miss the moon, which is very far away and moving at a very high speed. But in public policy, where you don't have to be that precise because there's a lot of activity that is beyond your control, it's not worthwhile looking at too many variables. So we're always looking for parsimonious theories. In other words, make the theory as simple as is possible. Number three, make your theory explicitly falsifiable. You should have in the introduction, all right, you know what? Here is the conventional wisdom, here's my theory. To see that my theory is wrong, to prove my theory wrong, this is what we have to look for. If we find this, then my theory is proven wrong. And you know, I understand why no one wants to do this because uh, they're, they're, they're going, you know, it makes it sound like they're going to risk having other people not convinced by their theory. But exposing your theory to falsification improves its validity, improves the confidence people have in the theory. And the very best analyses almost always have falsification criteria at the very beginning to guide the reader. It's very appreciated by readers. Number four, we want to have useful generalizations. We want to deal with the big topics like war, revolution, economic depression, the things that matter. And then we don't just want it to apply to one case. We want it to apply to a class of cases. We want to take knowledge and apply it as broadly as possible, even when we're only interested in one country. Because even when we're only interested in one country, we still draw on theories that are brought from other countries and therefore apply to multiple countries. Number five, we want the theories to be reproducible. Do not write in a complicated fashion. You do not have to write a literature essay. You should think of a political science essay as a slightly more verbose chemistry report. You don't need to start off your paper with a platitude like China's been a civilization for many years, or war is a common activity of humans. Erase it, write it if you feel the need, but then immediately delete it get right to the point. We have a puzzle. Uh, the puzzle is most countries have already had a revolution and China persists with its communist regime. What explains this persistence? Most people argue it's because the communist party has provided economic goods. I have an alternative explanation, which is that there's a Confucian culture that uh, uh, creates a certain amount of stability in the political establishment. Or, uh, uh, the mechanisms for influencing power in Beijing are uh, quite weak, and this stops political participation. So you can come up with, with you know, a whole bunch of hypotheses, but the idea is that they're clear and explicit. Your paper has to be so clear and obvious that if you were to be somehow incapacitated, someone else could pick up your research and continue it without problems. Writing in complicated language uh, uh, is not does not make your project reproducible. Your project should be easily understood. If you're reading a scientific, uh, a, a social scientific book, and it's difficult to understand, and you've reread it twice to figure out what the heck it's saying, you still don't understand it. It's not you. 
It's the author. They're using a language to hide something. And finally, a good theory could have heuristic value. In other words, it could be used to inspire other theories. It could be there to expose methodologies. So there's, there, there are values in having a good theory um, that stimulates thinking about other theory construction. Uh, here you can see the famous picture of the man standing in front of the tax, tanks after the June 4th incident, 1989, which is a Tiananmen Square massacre. And you can see uh, some of the remnants of the individuals uh, that were manhandled by the communist regime um, uh, during and after uh, that uh, public demonstration against the communist government. Now, one of the considerations when you're doing your case selection is stochastics, which is basically the probability of probabilities. There is something called the central limit theorem, which argues that all observable behavior in nature can be approximated by a normal bell curve. And this has two implications. The first is that, we, is that extreme outcomes occur with lower frequency. And the second is that random events are more likely to occur as, we, as the numbers we are observing are smaller. So what does this mean for your case selection? Whenever you're examining an event in small numbers, you're going to get a far more variance and range in outcomes than when you're looking at large numbers of aggregate phenomenon. For your paper, it means that when you're looking for a case, you need to try to think whether this case is an extreme case or whether it's a common case that's more like the average because we want cases that are more near the common average because we're able to generalize to other cases. If we look at an extreme case, then it may not be generalizable because it was a one in a million. Imagine, for example, if we were to rerun uh, Nazi Germany's attempt to uh, take over Europe uh, during the Second World War. Let's say we ran that as a simulation a million times. Uh, in that simulation, how often would the, the Nazi Germans win? Now, it's conceivable if they developed nuclear weapons, they could have deterred American intervention and taken out the Soviet Union, and they would have won. But probably, in a simulation, they would probably only have won 5% of the time. So using one of the cases that's, that occur 5% of the time as a test case, uh, what, I mean, would frankly uh, not be very generalizable. And so that's problematic in the social sciences, right? Because it, we want to find cases that we can generalize from. So here's a depiction of the normal bell curve. And you can imagine most of, uh, most of the cases would come from the center. Uh, and, and so we want to have cases from the center. And we don't, we don't want to have cases near the tails on the extreme left or right of the bell curve uh, because they're far less likely and therefore these being unlikely events, um, uh, again, it's, it comes down to a, a philosophic interpretation of reality. Uh, we know that Planckian uh, physics at the subatomic level is entirely probabilistic to the extent that matter does not even exist. And things exist because they probabilistically come into existence. Um, but at the material level, at the Newtonian level in physics, uh, we, we assume, in fact, there's determinism in, in effect that if we know all the rules and we know all the location of the matter governed by the rules, then we can make predictions in reality and play it like theater. And that means that human experience of free will is not real. Uh, and the reason we have to make this assumption is if we don't have determinism, then we can't make predictions. And if we have anything less than determinism, such as chaos, then uh, we need to be able to specify what the interaction is between the realm of chaos and the realm of determinism, which hasn't occurred yet. No one's quite achieved that. You can have probabilities, which is what you have in statistics, but probabilities are not so much about possible choices. Probabilities are about, uh, uh, um, about uncertainty. So if, if I'm holding a marble in my hands behind my back, there's a 50% chance the marbles in my left hand and the 50% chance it's in my right hand and the the you ascribing 50% doesn't actually say half of a marble is there or that the marble is in one hand half the time and half the time in the other it means you just don't know where it is and so uh, for a bell curve uh, if you were to rerun uh, World War II and Nazi attempts to take over Europe a million times uh, in a deterministic universe what happened would happen again. 
every single time exactly the same way. Um, but as a mental exercise, we imagine if some of the variables are different, and uh, therefore whether uh, outcomes could have been different. And so we do have to think about this when we're looking at cases, because there are cases that are uh, very misleading. This is a famous example of a misleading event. On February 27th, 1991, a Scud missile from Saddam Hussein's Iraq, when it was at war with the U.S., landed on a barracks in Saudi Arabia, and it killed a large number of U.S. personnel in those towers. And so the impact of that event caused the Pentagon to put a high emphasis on missile defense. Now, a Scud missile is basically a, a complicated rebuild of a Nazi rocket, the V-2 Vengeance rocket, the A-4 from World War II, not very accurate. And if Saddam Hussein had fired a million of these rockets at that target, probably uh, one or two would have hit. In other words, the probability of a rocket hitting an individual building is almost zero. Not zero, but almost zero. And so here we have a case uh, of an event that altered policy because the Pentagon put huge amounts of money into protecting its bases with interceptor uh, defenses, uh, missiles that are able to shoot down other incoming missiles, even though it was a giant waste of money because on average, those types of missiles would never hit their target. So when you're selecting your cases, uh, in this particular case, the policy outcome was the spending of billions and billions of dollars on a system that wasn't particularly useful. So when you're looking at a case, you want to make sure that that case isn't this kind of distortion, that it's not a small probability event, but that it's being recognized as an average probability event.